JC News, St. John Church News. Here's your anchor, Sandra Dorsey. We say thank you to all of our community families for their tremendous support in our church anniversary celebration on last Sunday. We truly appreciate your acts of faith and giving. We stop in this moment to solicit each St. John family for their monetary support. And we pray that you will step out in faith in our call to you at this time. If you have not supported the $200 sacrificial offering of love for the 152nd church anniversary, we ask that you please do so. We need you, St. John, to honor this call. Join us this Monday morning at 7 a.m. for prayer. Prayer changes things. Stay tuned for our family nights with St. John Church. Details to follow soon. That concludes this week's edition of SJC News. Be informed, stay connected, and spread the news. Now here's Donya Albright. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Greetings, St. John family, and welcome to today's virtual worship experience. Please be reminded that members of the finance team will be here today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to receive your tithes and offerings. You may also take advantage of use of our cash app. Please be reminded that God loves a cheerful giver. And now let us be blessed with a word from our pastor, Reverend Washington. Good morning. This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be graciously glad in it. I am Pastor Richard Allen Washington. And once again, it is a blessing to come into your home, your car, or wherever you might be on this wonderful Sunday morning. Truly, we are blessed and favored to walk into the fourth week of the month of September and we are blessed to share it one with you. This is a true day that the Lord has made and I'm rejoicing and I'm really excited about what the Lord has promised to do in prayer and now we wanna see God manifested with one another. Thank you so much to each and every one of you who have supported the effort, the sacrificial gift of love that St. John is asking for in this season. We are, again, celebrating 152 years. And on last Sunday, we gathered together, celebrated together. And if you have not given as a member of St. John, if you have not supported the effort that we have asked for in a sacrificial gift of love, $200, some of you may say, Pastor, I can't do 200. That's okay. We're asking that you make an effort to join us collectively so that we're able to celebrate and we're able to trust what we are giving to God for St. John's development and for its progression. I'm asking you again to support the effort. And even if you have given, please don't stop. Support the effort. We're looking for this. We need this support so that we can continue the ministry. Let me say again, we need this support so that we can continue to do the ministry of God through this wonderful fellowship and this virtual reality. I am so thankful for you listening this morning and let's go to part two of this wonderful message, the true state of church that God has for us on today. I invite you to come with me to the book of Galatians, to the letter to the Galatia community. And in that community, I want you to turn with me to chapter six. And in chapter six, there's just two verses I wanna concentrate on today. We're in part two. and prayerfully the concluding part of this two-part series. I want you to go to Galatians chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 from the Revised Standard Version of this Greek New Testament text. And let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So then, we have an opportunity let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. Amen. This is not the time, not the place to give up. Part two, this is not the time, not the place to give up. Let us pray. Eternal God, on this wonderful day 
a day that you've made and given us an opportunity to walk into a grand blessing. We do so this morning centered on your word. You have promised in your scripture that your word will feed us where others cannot. So we are asking to be fed this morning. We're asking that this word, this sermonic moment, be used to reveal unto us the richness of your plan for our life in the moment and season that we're in. We're claiming victory. We're claiming walking over the challenge and we're doing it in the name of Jesus. So speak to us now in this moment through your word and this your servant. Help us to give you the glory in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you so much and let's dig right in. There is no need for a major introduction. You do recall, remember last week, out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winched nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but I'm bowed. My brothers and sisters, those who are a part of certain organizations had to commit those experiences, learning that to memory. I shall never forget how upon becoming a member of a particular organization, how my mother, when I began to share that particular poem by William Ernest Henley, how my mother began to recite it as I began to read it. My brothers and sisters, this poem is entitled Invictus. And William Ernest Henley was a poet, a British writer who had the gall and the sagacity to write this again, my brothers and sisters, while he was facing a difficult and challenging circumstance. Doctors had told him in the hospital that he would have to give up and amputee a leg. And to get through it, he turned his face toward the wall, according to the historical record, and began to inspire himself by writing the poem Invictus. My brothers and sisters, what grabbed me is not the entire poem as much as one phrase. And there are some theological concerns that I do have with this poem, and I'll deal with that potentially if the Lord allows us today. But what I do want you to call to remembrance in that poem is the word unconquerable soul. My brothers and sisters, in the times that we're living, we need an unconquerable soul. When we are facing the challenges, the ups and the downs that we are going through, not last month, but this month right now. To be frank with you, I was listening and reading this week, learning that uh, $887 billion is what Americans are wrestling with in credit card debt, not household debt, not mortgage debt just credit card debt, $887 billion. People are struggling, trying to make their ends meet. And the experts are saying that if you want to reduce your credit card debt, one of the things you should do is to increase your savings account so that you won't have to utilize your credit card for those emergency life experiences. I've heard people say in the midst of hearing those kinds of reports from the experts, the reason that I'm using my credit card is because I don't have a savings. And if I had a savings, I would not have to use a credit card. People are attempting to find you unusual ways to make the ends connect and get from month to month. If we're honest, while we try to live above some of the means that we should, many of us are living check to check because of the times in which we live. There are seasons like that where the surplus that God had given us has dried up because of the seasons of a famine. And my brother and sister, we have lived in the midst and through a first part of a pandemic. And I want to prophetically say to us this morning that the pandemic is not over. It is not concluded. We are living through it. There are biblical records that God sometimes allow pandemics to last 12 years, 14 years. And if we are Looking back at the life of the children of God in Israel, they lasted longer than that. 40 years of a pandemic, my brothers and sisters. People have born, been born and people have died. People have walked and people have sat down. People have gained jobs and people have lost jobs. My brothers and sisters, there have been a number of challenges and victories that have happened throughout the pandemic. 
Today, I want you to recognize with me that to make it through these unconquerable times, you need an unconquerable soul. You need a soul that has the strength and the foundation that God intended for every believer in God to have. Right now, those of us who believe God and ascribe to the faith of Christianity need to recognize that more than anything, we have to have an unconquerable soul. This is not the time to give up on your God. This is not the time to give up on the lifestyle of Jesus the Christ. This is not the time to give up on the historical, powerful HBCU church. I said it, church. Most of the historically black colleges and universities came out of the historically black church. And this is not a time to run from it. This is not a time to abandon it. This is a time to trust God in the midst of the pandemics of your life. This is a time to lean not to your understanding because your and my understanding is limited to what we know. And I've come to recognize I don't know enough about what God is up to, to trust the way that I feel about some things in my life. I've got to trust the way of God. I've got to understand the proverb that says, lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways, acknowledge the Lord and God will direct your path. Because often in our lives, our own understanding has gotten us into circumstances that only God has the power and watch this, the experience to get us out of. I don't want you to give up on God. I don't want you to give up on yourself. I don't want you to give up on the gift that God deposited in you, that God is using transitions and challenges in your life right now to mold, to shape, and get this, to develop you into the wonderful child that God has destined you to become. This text is about that. This text and this subject matter for 152 years, family, is about a congregation making a decision to not trust in their own way, not trusting in the way of a man or a woman, not trusting in the way of the experienced doctors and life coaches of the culture, but deciding to stand in the word of God's rich tradition and lean on to God for getting all of us through the challenges that we are facing. When you and I lean into God and not our own understanding, we avoid ditches, we avoid debt, we avoid, watch this, promotions that were really problems. We avoid relationships that will run us raggedy instead of relationships that will lift us and elevate us. When we lean into God, we understand that the ways of God are blessings in eternal and the ways of life and the ways of the world are death and degradation. When we lean into God, we understand that the wages of sin is death. I like preaching that. But the gift of God is eternal life. Old school. And every now and then, I need to share this with you. I need to hear this myself. Let me pause and put a kickstand of spiritual dimensions down and say to you and to me, doing the wrong thing, the wrong way leads you to hell, but doing it God's way will lead you to eternal life. Preach pastor. So this morning, it's a pleasure to remind you and me that we need to look at life, not from the lens of the culture, not from the lens of the corporations that have destined us to get into what we're in now. We need family to lean not to the understanding of this world, but family, we've got to lean to the understanding of God, which is family, to require that we have a long view of life. What is the long view? Just a recap real quick. One word, a long view in life is a perspective on living that says that no matter where I am now, it's not final. My brothers and sisters, it's important that you and I have a long view of life because in the long view of life, as I said last week, it is so vital that we understand that good things take time. Healthy relationships from friendships to family take time to develop and a career that is successful will never take place quickly. We again want things quick, but if you start quick, you'll end quick. If you have the power to trust God, you can start slow and last eternally. 
My brothers and sisters, that was last week. This week, I just have two things that I want to drop in your spirit as we celebrate 152 years. And I believe that what has sustained St. John for 152 years is having a long view and a long perspective of life. Secondly, in the text today, it says, and Paul says, and let us not grow weary in well-doing. I want to pause and say the second thing that I've discovered that has blessed this congregation for 152 years, and it will be a principle to bless us another 152 years, I believe is something that we've got to enhance and build upon. And I believe it's something that you and I can do in our life that will elevate us in ways that we never could imagine. The second most important aspect of this text that Paul is sharing with the people at Galatia is not only a long view in life, family, a selfless view in life. The word Paul says is to not grow weary in well-doing. Let me share this with you quickly. The children of Galatia that were following God, as I shared last week, were frustrated because guess what? They had been doing the godly thing, but there had been no results. And that's why the long view that Paul says to them in verse 7, which is not to be deceived, God ain't mocked. Whatever you're sowing, you're going to reap. When Paul says that, he says to them, be clear. Life doesn't happen on the terminology and time frame that you like. And today I come back to say to you, as Paul says to them, as they complain, but what about and how come and why not? Paul says, I need you to understand that you and I cannot grow weary in doing good. Paul says we have to have a selfless view, a view on life that is not determined by what you see. That's long. But now you got to have a view on life that gives yourself away. Let me see if I can make it live. Paul says we must not grow weary in doing well. We must not grow weary in doing well. We must not grow weary in doing well. In essence, he says, I know that people are saying that you are following the way of Christ and it's flunking. I know that you're hearing people fall away from the gospel of Jesus Christ, leaving Christianity, walking away from the flavor of God through religious experiences. I know that. I know a number of people who say I used to be. I used to be, I used to be a follower of God through Christ in that denomination. I used to be a Christian in that way, but I'm no longer that. I know hundreds, thousands of people who said that. Paul says, I need you to understand that being spiritual is one thing, but you do need a religion, a way to work out your spirituality. And working out your spirituality, priest pastor, is not just looking at life in a long-term view. It is looking at life in a selfless view. Let me, let me pastor you for one moment. You need to understand that in this culture we live in, where people are believing that it's better to be spiritual, you know, people will say in a minute, oh, I'm spiritual, I'm not Christian, I'm not religious, I'm not contained to a particular denomination and religion, I'm just spiritual. Come here for a minute, let me tell you how ignorant that sounds. First and foremost, declaring that you are spiritual is not special. It is not distinctive because the world understands that we are all spiritual beings. There are faith groups that are spiritual that worship the devil. Matter of fact, you need to know this, that one of the fastest growing religious groups, spiritual groups, let me say it that way, spiritual groups are satanic worshipers. They are starting satanic worshiping groups in high schools now and you are talking about I'm spiritual and they started under the guise of spirituality come here being spiritual is not special being spiritual is the beginning of understanding this you have to have a context to work out that which you claim is spiritual in your life you got to have a pedagogy you got to have some place to work out what you have declared you believe. Religion follows spirituality because it is the lifestyle 
of a spiritual person declaring that they've discovered something about themselves and it's how they formalize that walk, that experience. You need religion to walk out your spirituality. You can't say I'm spiritual and have no way to walk it out. Someone said, well, I got a fellowship that believes what I believe. How is the disciplinary activity of your human behavior being changed? You are spiritual, but how are you being transformed? You need the religion part, the ABCs of walking out your faith. And let me say that the dogma, the creeds, and the ways of the religions that we know are how people for centuries, not just you and your lifetime, what you read on the internet, but for centuries have walked out their declaration that I'm spiritual. Come here, come here, come here. America needs to understand this. We are not the first people to discover great things about God. Now I wanna, I wanna preach this real clearly to you. We are not the first people to discover some newness about God. People have been discovering ways of God for centuries. And what makes us in culture now believe that we are correct when we haven't lived as long as others have lived before us. Preach pastor. I'm simply saying that to be spiritual needs a reality, a forum to walk it out. And beloved, religions are how you do that. You have to be a part of a body which walks out what you have said you believe. Therefore, you need a church home. So that you can walk out the ways that you declare you have spiritually been developed. You need to attach yourself to a group who by body, behavior, walk out the principles that you said you believe. You need a group that says, I am going to feed the hungry. That I am going to work to clothe the, the naked. You need a group that declares that I will lift up the kingdom of God through gift. Financially, you need a body that believes that I'm going to work while I can to develop the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. You cannot do that by yourself. You can't do that without being connected to a fellowship that holds you, watch this, accountable and responsible for your spirituality in a way that declares that I am better because I declared I am spiritual. Paul says you got to have the ability in the face of people who said don't give, don't do that. In the face of people who say fall back. In the face of people who say it ain't working. You got to have the ability, Paul says, to not grow weary in doing the lifestyle of God through Christ Jesus. You cannot grow weary in blessing them that curse you. What do I mean? You can't grow weary when people have dug the ditch for you to fall in, curse you, stop you from becoming. You can't grow weary and doing right even when they are doing wrong. Two wrongs, don't make it right, baby. You gotta do the right thing even in the culture where everybody's doing their own thing. That's what makes Christianity distinctive. That's what's made St. John last. 152 years. People have decided that while others have fallen away and have walked away and decided that this is not the way that they want to go, there are persons who have decided, as for me and the household that I have, God has been good to me, God has blessed me, God has walked with me, God has changed me, and I'm going to walk out doing the things of Christ Jesus in this fellowship. Boy, my brother and sister, you can move from house to house and still be the same. Relationship to relationship and will not change. Brother, sister, you got to walk out the principles of love, of faith, and peace in the company of those who see that it takes some time. Paul says, don't you grow weary in doing well. It's hard to continue to do right by folk when they are constantly stabbing you in the back, when people are constantly lying and creating narratives that are not true. But Paul said, if you can have the selfless view, 
which is to say, I'm not doing this for my own self and aggrandizement. I'm not doing this for my own ability to get a blessing from somebody. I'm not doing this because I want a plaque. I want my name called or I want a earthly promotion. Paul says, you must do it. Why? Because it's the right thing, but also do it because it's the lifestyle that Christ demands. We do the right thing, not because we want a pat on the back. We do the right thing because God, through Christ Jesus, has said we should do it. The selfless view is determined to do the right thing in spite of what the culture does. If everybody does what the culture says do, we would end our lives as we know it. Somebody has to believe in God's word. Somebody has to have faith the size of the mustard seed and trust that the ways of God Give us victories in the future and even in the now. Somebody has to have the faith of the Hebrew boys that says we ain't bowing. Somebody has to have the faith of Daniel in that lion's den. That's why the book of Daniel is so important in the midst of a culture that trances and changes and shifts. Somebody has to have the concrete nature of Christ and hold on in seasons of desert living. You gotta do it, you gotta not grow weary in doing right when the world has suggested that you ought be doing it a wrong and different way. 152 years, you don't last 152 years without doing things the right way. You, you don't even last from week to week, from month to month, from year to year in the times we live doing the things the cultural way. Social media has made that a reality. You can do something wrong one time and they'll cancel you. The culture will cancel you. But I'm so glad, priest pastor, that I serve a God who doesn't cancel me because of the mistakes I make. I serve a selfless God who's willing to stand in the middle of my fire and say, you messed up, but I'm still believing that the best in your life is yet to come. Do I have a witness? Who God will not turn his back on when the culture will turn its back on you. I'm done. I'm done. I, I got happy. I, I didn't mean to go that far. But I'm telling you right now, people need to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Do not grow weary in well-doing, Paul says. I want to share a testimony with you right now. If you've been blessed by God to be a Christian, it's not about what you have. It's about your willingness to give it on behalf of God to do the right thing. I've never seen God take what you give and not bless you in return. Let me see if I can say it another way. I heard one member, God bless his heart, still living in his 90s. Tell me one day at a congregation I served, Pastor, I've never seen God take anything I've given and I miss it. You don't miss what you give to God. Hallelujah, somebody. Whatever you sacrificially offer to God, God will bless you beyond what you gave. A bishop once said this, God will not allow you to indebt him. Woo, that's deep. God will never allow humanity to be owed anything of God. Everything God does, God will pay dividends. Do I have a witness? You can't outgive God. You can't do it. Every time you give, God will bless you in ways you never asked for. That's how it gives. So I'm saying, do the right thing. Trust God. Trust God this week in your giving. And watch God give back to you in ways you didn't even know you needed. Do I have any witnesses in here? Let me, let me press on. There was once testimony. There was once a, at the gas station. And uh, at the gas station, someone pulled up and gas was high. You remember a few months ago when gas was extraordinarily high. So someone pulled up and it was a young family. They, they were in a late modeled car. They went inside and I was inside also. They were asked how much gas you want to put in. And that father reached in his pocket and said, I want to put $10 worth on number two. 
And he gave his crumbled up $10 cash, put it up there. And the lady remarked, that's all? And he said, that's all I have. And she said, you ain't gonna get very far. He said, I might not, but I gotta make an effort with what I got. He went back outside and I stood there. And let me be clear, I ain't got a lot. Let me just be clear, I don't have a lot. I'm in the season just like you. I'm, I'm, I'm depending on God to make a way out of no way for me just like you. I got family just like you. I'm trying to make ends meet just like you. But in that moment, the Christ in me stood up. And while I didn't have much and I came in to pay for my glass, I couldn't let that family walk out of there like that, not knowing if they were gonna get to their destination. But I was inspired by that man's word who said, I got to make an effort with what I got. And I said, put another, and I looked out there and said, how much you think it'll take to fill it? The person told me behind the rest, I said, fill it up and put it on this. And I prayed and asked God to repay me. You don't understand. And I went on ahead, got my gas, didn't say nothing to that family because it wasn't about that. But I left and they were still filling up their tank when I left. I was grateful that God was going to bless that family to get everywhere they needed to believe to get that day I believed. Come here. I gave that day because I felt led by God to do it. And it was the right thing to do. A few weeks later, a few weeks later, I was at the grocery store picking up something for one of my children. Fooled around and left my wallet in the car. And it was a long line in the back. And you know, when you get in line, everybody get mad when you have to stop and leave and do all that stuff. And I said, oh my goodness, I forgot my, my wallet. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to leave this here and go get it. The person behind me, two persons behind me said, no, you don't. I got that. I'm paying it forward. C come here for a minute. You don't know when God's going to bless you when you are selfless. Have a selfless view on life, brother. Have a selfless view on what you have, sister. And watch God return it to you in ways you never thought or imagined God will. And that's called overflow. Paul says you got to have a spirit of selflessness. Let me rush on. Text says... Paul, why should we not grow weary in doing the well and, and well, doing the right thing? Paul says, because in due season, you will reap if you faint not. Come here for a minute. There are four seasons. There are fall, winter, spring, and summer. But there's one more that I've discovered while walking with Jesus Christ. There's one more I've discovered being a Christian that it may not be available to everyone because they don't have the selfless view of life. There is a due season. There's a winter when God will freeze some stuff and you don't have nothing. There's a summer where it will be so hot and overflowing with things for you that you can't believe it. There will be a fall when people and situations will fall away from you and you will be bare preparing for the winter. And there will be a spring when the things that died start coming back in your life. Ooh, hallelujah. But after all of that, there's a due season. And a due season means when I am finished with everything that I can do, and the Lord has chosen to bless me when I didn't deserve it. A due season will come. A due season will come when you live a selfless life. A due season is a freedom from cancer. A due season is a door opening that you didn't ask for. A due season is a bridge over waters that are troubling that you don't know are troubling. A due season is an opportunity you didn't ask for, look for, but it came anyway. A due season is when God takes the midnights and turns them into bright afternoons. The due season is when the burdens are lifted and the heavy load is walked away. The due season is when you sing that the Lord has made a way somehow. There's a due season and it will come if you live a selfless life. And finally, beloved, the reason it's not time to quit is because you might be in a place where your due season is about to come. If you can live in that selfless view, if you can live in that long view, your due season, according to the word of God and according to Paul, will come. And Paul knows about it. 
Paul knows about a due season. Paul knows that it will come. Jesus knows it will come. The faithful of the church of the living God knows it will come. Your grandmama know it. Your granddaddy knows it. Your mama know it. Your daddy knows it. Your aunts and your uncles know it. There's a due season where you don't ask, but God show sure enough gives. There's a due season of restoration. That's, that's for somebody right here. Don't give up. Don't you quit. The due season in your life might be knocking at your door. It might be when you get out the house this morning. It might be when the mail comes. It, it might be tomorrow. It might be tonight. But I'm encouraging you, hang on. The due season is on the way. Then finally, I got to let you go. Been too long. Finally, long view, selfless view. Then you got to have an eternal view. You know what Paul says? Don't lose heart. He says, we have an opportunity to do good, especially to those in the household of faith. What Paul is saying is we do good because ultimately we believe that the best is yet to come. We do good to people who are believers in Christ because we believe that there is a place not made by hands of humans. We do good because we have an eternal view on life. Let me tell you something, there will come a moment where everybody calls on God. There will come a moment where even the Gnostic, the atheists call on God. Yes, sir. There will be a moment where people call on the Lord in ways that you never imagined they would. So I'm going I'm to stop. I'm not even going to shut it down like I was going to shut it down. I'm going to just say this. You need an eternal view on your life. You need to look at what you're in now. What, what, wait. A long view, an eternal view. What's the difference? I'm glad you asked. A long view believes that things will turn around for me in a due season. A eternal view believes that even when they turn around, that still isn't the best that God's got to give to me. An eternal view believes that God has the last word. A long view believes that the things are going to turn around. But the eternal view says that God has the last word, not my job, not my enemy, not the lie, not the rumor, not the bad mistake, not the misery, not the mess, but the Lord. And this week, I've been listening and looking at the news. They are talking about the mistakes of men and women in the media. They're talking about the challenges that people have in giving people redemption. The eternal view believes that even when the world is done with us, that there's a God who can redeem us. The eternal view says what Joseph says, what you meant for evil, my God has turned into my good. And I've come to tell somebody, don't you give up. It's not the time nor the place to shut it down. It's the time and the place to believe in the word of God that says when we are slayed, the best is still yet to come. It's time to believe the word of God that says we ought to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. It's time to believe the word of God that says, though I am slayed, I will trust because my redeemer is on the way. It's time to believe the 23rd Psalm that says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It's time to believe that though we are walking in the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear not one evil thing because God is with us and God will keep us. It's time to believe what the believers in the Bible believe, that God has the last word. May you have a wonderful week. May you look at life this week with a long view. May you have a selfless interpretation of doing the right thing. And may you look at life with an eternal outlook, the best is yet to come. Be encouraged. Have a great week and may the Lord bless you real good. Again, don't forget, help us this week. We are grateful.